Hey folks, I'm International Master John Watson, and this is Ask the Master on ICC-TV. The main idea of this show is to provide players with a forum to ask questions about chess and the chess world. Uh, I've been gone for a couple of weeks, and so I see some. I'm very glad to see that a couple of you haven't given up on, on the show, and we'll probably be a little bit short today just because it's been there's been a little gap there. Um, so uh, let me talk about, to people who haven't seen the show before, that uh, what we do is we answer questions about chess, any kind of questions you have, and uh, you can send these questions in advance, which is the best way, because then you can really think about the question, I can really think about the answer, and that's at askiamwatson at chessclub.com. That's an email, A-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at chessclub.com. So that's a... Uh, that's an email address, and you can ask any sort of question from that. You can also ask live right now on the chat on your right on YouTube. Uh, and um, we have a lot of fun with that. There's a lot of regulars that come on, and hopefully we tell your friends, and we can get some new, play new people coming on and get a real conversation going. Uh, what kind of questions? You can ask about openings, of course, because that's a big, big thing we always get. Um, you can ask about preparation, about training, about uh, all whatever kind of problems you're having over the board. You can send me games, by the way. That's something we've been we've been showing quite a few games by other people who've been sending their games, and then we comment on them. And the best way to send a game is also to maybe make a theme that goes along with it. Maybe ask a question about it. Uh, you know, what could I have done here or there? Or what do you think of this game? Or what do you think of this system? That kind of stuff. Um, you can all, you can talk about books. You can talk about chess history. There's all kinds of possibilities. So you can go back over old shows to see what we've talked about before. Uh, I put up the updates for the last few shows, and there are now updates that list all of the shows going back all the way to the beginning of this show back in 2015, and that's on my Facebook page. Oh, the opening topics. That's just the opening topics that we look at. And that's on my Facebook page, John L. Watson, three words, uh, which is on, and it's on my timeline, John L. Watson, three words. Um, so it's not on the main page, it's on the timeline. Um, so then what you can do then, once you see what openings were treated in what show, is you can go back to the shows, which are all archived on YouTube, and you can scroll through them to find the section of the show that you're looking for. You don't have to watch the whole show, you can just scroll through by dragging your mouse along the bottom and then until the position pops up that you are looking for. Okay, so as I say, I was gone, been gone for a couple of weeks, and let's see what we've got on the chat here. I'm really glad to see that somebody showed up because I was thinking, boy, I, if I were you, I'd probably have given up by this point. I saw you went to the Isle of Man tournament. Yeah, I didn't uh, didn't do much there. Did he beat a GM? Not in this case. I have beaten GMs, but not in this case. I had a very bad tournament. On the other hand, it was kind of fun, and I learned a lot, and... Uh, I haven't completely given up. I sort of understand what's going on. You know, most of these uh, players are either professional or basically full-time. Um, so um, I could show you a game from the Isle of Man. Um, I might do that. Let's see about that. Um, hmm, that's an interesting idea. Maybe we'll, we'll probably wait on that because we've got other things to look at. But I can always do that next week, too. Uh, yeah, I had a couple really interesting games. A couple of games I lost actually uh, have some... Theoretical importance and are also that's one thing I found is people's theory. The, the I, I, I teach people, but I don't really study my own openings very much, and I I'm very impressed with how how incredibly well prepared these people are in almost all openings. So uh, I, that was one of the things I learned is you really need to, I needed to be a little better prepared. Uh, that would have helped. I also had to I should have gotten there earlier. I was very tired, and that didn't help. The first few games I had jet lag really badly and was kind of useless. Um, so, and hopefully I'm not, I haven't just turned into a completely weak player, but <laughs> but I felt I felt like some of the games I was thinking really well, and I, I would just have to play more often, maybe get a little more rest before the tournament. And, uh, oh, I can't believe the video is frozen. We have been working, we have been working so hard today on making this video work. Absolutely amazing. We tested it again and again. How does this happen? Wow, folks, this is amazing. We 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 just went. We we spent all, what two hours? That's my with my producer, uh, testing the system and working on this. M maybe maybe the the yes, I was suffering from not not having enough uh, the lack of Tuesday. That's it. I didn't. If I'd only been uh, if I'd only been working on uh, Ask the Master, I would have done better. But um, 
Sorry about this frozen screen again. This is quite amazing. I will try one time to restart it, if that's okay. And then um, if that fails, we will just live with it. And then next week, I'll do something different. We, we tested it. We had it working for quite a while. In fact, I just restarted the whole computer to sort of guarantee that this would work. Um, since it doesn't, I'm going to turn off the stream for just a second, and I'll be right back. I'm going to try and restart it and hope that that helps us somehow. So here we go. Give me a second. Okay, well, hopefully I'm back. Um, wow, this is interesting because even in the program that streams, it's not just your YouTube uh, video that's frozen. It's also the original program, uh, which I'm streaming from, is frozen. So I'm afraid there's got to be any solution for this. So we're going to spend one more week where we just, you just hear my voice and you stare at my mug and uh, hopefully you really stare at the board and uh, we'll talk about that. So um, thank you, everybody. Yes, it looks like you will have to do with that. I, I, by the way, tell me if I'm back on again. Uh, yeah, we'll work on it again. I may have to switch computers. It's a little difficult because of the, uh, my laptop doesn't really perform certain functions, but maybe by next week I'll um, I'll try to figure out some other way to do this. I might have to switch to another computer because this is the third time now we've had this freezing thing. It's funny that it waits till the start of the show to do it. I don't know. <laughs> so maybe, maybe one of you is sabotaging it. I am on. Thank you. It's good to know. Okay, so let's just go on and go ahead. Um, I don't see any immediate questions. Let me just go ahead with some questions that we got before. Oh, here's a nice historical one that I was asked a few weeks ago. How did the first world champion, chess champion, come about? And why wasn't Morphy considered it when he played? Okay, so the official world championship is generally regarded to have begun in 1886. I actually looked up Wikipedia to see what the, sort of the standard spiel was on the on the world championship because I've heard so many versions. And um, that's that's the Zugatork Steinitz match, and that is true that after that 1886 match, Steinitz was considered sort of officially world champion. But most people think that his world championship started many years before um, when he won a big, major, major uh, tournament. Um, and I think that was the, the Lund uh, well, even, actually, there are some people who think you could go back to people like Anderson and Morphy. Um, but before we get to that, let me just say that, that before 1886, let me talk about some of the earlier players who were just sort of generally considered by a majority of uh, historians to have been the best player in the world. So you could consider them sort of world champions for their period. And that includes Roy Lopez, um, Greco, who was a fantastic player. Jeremy Selman has a special love for Greco and thinks he was way, way ahead of his time. Philidor, most of you have heard of. Le Bourdonnais, De La, Bord uh, De La Bourdonnais, who was, um, uh, played the famous match with McDonald, but seemed to be clearly above, way ahead of his time in terms of uh, chess. And then, in, and that's, that's early 1800s, and then in 1851, there was this big London tournament, which was won by Anderson, Adolf Anderson, who was really a terrific player. And, uh, and Anderson subsequently lost a match to Morphy uh, in the late 1850s, and then most people in the, uh, considered Morphy the best player in the world. Um, the, and so you could consider Morphy one of the first world cha modern world champions in that sense. Um, but... Steinitz is the one who, um, after Steinitz won it, people started calling it the World Championship. And when he played a match with someone, in this case, in the next case, it was Lasker, uh, then that was considered a World Championship match. So that's kind of how it all started. Uh, Morphy's, Morphy had already died by the time. Um, well, actually, Morphy died much later, but he was out of chess completely at the, at the, by the time that uh, Steinitz played uh, Zuckertort. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that Steinitz played... Um, uh, well, there was the Zuckertorg match, and then there was also the the um, the Ste uh, an Anderson match where he beat him. Anderson actually Steinitz actually beat Anderson some 20 years earlier uh, in a match, but, the, but that didn't give him the official world championship. But it was worth worth mentioning that. And he also won Steinitz's match record was incredible. He tended to win these matches. He played most of the leading players of his day, and he won very decisively. I believe he won something like 23 straight matches, uh, a, a, 
and nine or ten of those were against the very leading players of the day. So he was clearly the best player of his time for quite a long time, and then Lasker beat him and so forth. So um, so that's just sort of a general background. I don't know if anybody wants to mention, did, um, did S also not beat Anderson? Uh, Staunton? No. Steinitz, yes, thank you. And I just got to that. Good point. I should have read your note, and I would have mentioned that. Yeah, that was in 1866, I think. So 20 years before Zucatorn. Um, Anderson sort of adopted the mantle of the best player in the world after he lost to Morphy and after Morphy retired because he won some, another very good tournament. I don't remember which one. but So Anderson was a little strong. Historically, Anderson is known for his defeats uh, but um, to, to Morphy and Steinitz, but was in fact quite a strong player. He was just a little bit erratic. Uh, but uh, quite a, quite an interesting and very modern in some ways. He played uh, strange things like like the Paulson Sicilian, which which Paulson of course played also. And Paulson was a player, a contemporary player. But these are very modern modern openings. Um, okay, so that was just a historical question. Uh, I got a question about that I never answered about this position that's before you on the board and this move. Oh, I'm sorry, not this move. Actually, the question is about this move, the Cozio defense. And he says, what do you think of this variation? There are a few games in my database with Aronian where he scores quite well. The games were interesting, I thought. Of course, some of the games were Rapids or Blitz games. Um, so I looked this up, and I was kind of amazed. I mean, I remember the Cozio from early on, but nobody I never took it very seriously. And it's done remarkably well. There are 3,500 games in my largest database, and they go back over 100 years to the early days. I mean, Anderson, for example, who we just talked about, played it. So did Steinitz, who we just talked about. So did Spielman, and so did Olyekin. Um The one world champion who used it more than anybody else was Smyslov. Smyslov used it quite often, usually drawing uh, against very strong players. Um, and among current players, this guy Sandipan, you may have heard of, a very strong uh, GM. And uh, Radulov has played just scores and dozens of games with it. So I thought I'd check a correspondence database to see how it does under, whether they trust it enough to even play it in correspondence, whether there's some line that's just considered to give White an advantage and so people really avoid it. And um, actually, it's done just fine. There doesn't seem to be such a line. White has about a 100-point performance rating advantage, which is absolutely normal for a White, for a white side of an opening. It's, a, it's not even a slightly better... It's not even slightly worse. So the Cozio defense, Knight GE7 here, has not even done slightly worse than the average defense for black, which is kind of amazing. And that was also true of the mainstream um, databases that I looked at. And I didn't write down those results, but they, the, the results were quite, quite reasonable. So then I looked more specifically at things, and I, decided, and I saw that the main lines are uh, C3, just trying to expand in the center, D4, uh, trying to immediately take over the center, and just Castle sort of waiting to play either C3 or D4 usually. So um, in fact, after Castles, I think that this is probably the best way to go for Black, although Black can sometimes does play here and hasn't done that badly with a little bit of control here. You know, G6 has turned out to be a pretty good square in these double E-pawn openings. So maybe someone might want to revive this move, Knight G6. But the usual idea that Cozy is to play D6, sort of like an old Steinitz defense, but also G6 and Bishop G7. So in this exact position, this variation comes up quite a bit, this, this position here. And that one's the one that, um, that, that's a critical position that can also come up by other move orders. So I just thought I'd show you the sort of overview there. Um, so let me show you two games with it, with the Cozio. This is actually fun stuff because a lot of you might want to play the black side of, of these positions and don't know what to do against the Roy Lopez because after all, if you play here, you also have to learn the exchange variation. Um, you might be bored by the Berlin <laughs> and or just may not want to play it for one reason or another. Uh, this is a very interesting alternative. I see absolutely nothing wrong with this. Some quite strong players are playing it and they're doing perfectly well with it. So... Um, and uh, Ronian is no slouch, obviously, one of the, what is he, ranked number two in the world again right now, I think, uh, live rating. Um, so let me see. Uh, Martinuski played, I didn't know that. Martinuski played a lot of interesting openings. Oh, look at this, bunch of bunch of comments. Let me um, let me just go on here. Yeah, two hours. We really worked on fixing that freezing thing. I don't know what happened. <laughs> it's amazing that it, it happened immediately. Uh, maybe I made a mistake in restarting the computer. 
After fully accepting the Smith Mora is Bishop before pinning the knight a viable plan. Never seen anyone recommending. Yeah, I'm not real thrilled with that. We'll get back to that. So, um, okay. Yeah, so Martinowski played it. I didn't realize that. Uh, let's, um, let's look at this game first. It's funny. I thought I had notes on this. Let me just see here for a second. Which one is this? This is uh, Mikhailovsky. Yeah, I've got I've got two games here. Let me just take a quick little note so I don't, because I want to give you an overview of, of what the lines are. And if I don't do that, it's just a game without any context. And it's not as practical for you guys to pick it up. Um, in this game, Black actually played here. So let me show you a couple more things about this. After this, uh, d4 is a possibility. And black can play either knight takes d4 or uh, um, pawn takes d4. I think pawn takes d4 makes more sense. And then g6, and he's just planning to get pressure on the diagonal and attack that knight twice. And really, black's done pretty reasonably well here. He goes, goes there, excuse me, attacking this. And then the bishop takes. Bishop, bishop defends. And uh, let me see. Black castles, white castles. Oh, yeah, and then you can play just, Black's played both these moves, just simple move, sort of slow. He's got a little less space, but it turns out this is done perf perfectly well. And this move has also done quite well. I think Aronian played that, actually. The idea of that move is that, is that if white plays there, which is really the only really challenging move, um, then Black will probably just play here. I mean, he can't actually take the pawn directly, but this one's more, more sort of obvious. Getting a knight there looks like it's going to equalize, so... So that's d4, which doesn't seem to be too big a threat. Uh, so another key move is c3. I think we'll see c3, but let me just show you anyway. Oh, one thing about playing c3 right away instead of castling in c3 is black can make this move d5. Almost looks like a Ponzani opening or something, right? Like in the Ponzani, for example, we get um, we get uh, here d5 immediately, and then sometimes white plays bishop b5, and maybe black will play knight e7. Or after queen a4, sometimes black plays knight e7 too, like that. So um, this is sort of similar. This is um, this is bishop b5 first, knight e7, c3, and black plays d5. And this has actually worked out pretty well. Uh, it looks like white can just take that, but then black takes here. And now black has the idea of queen d5. Looks quite good. And he's got a little bit of pressure on that hole down there. So white needs white plays here normally. Black takes en passant, and white can try to pile up on f7 and c6, but it doesn't really do much, because after that, um, just for example, uh, knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes, pawn takes. Here, he can just go bishop e7, d7 again, and I think this is considered completely fine. Um, white can try and win it, pick up this pawn, uh, for example, like that. But then black gets a big attack, and there have been several games with this. Black's got two bishops. White's very underdeveloped, and you know the king's. These guys are sort of aiming at the king's side. The rook can go to b8 and then lift. This rook can be on another open file. That's compensation for a pawn. Good compensation. So that just gives you an overview of some of the some of the simple things to do, and that's one reason why c3 immediately is actually maybe not very good. D5 is actually been given an exclamation point, and that's probably a good answer. So that's why castles is actually the most popular order. Now in this game, black played g6 first, and you might think that's irrelevant, but what we're going to do is we're going to end up transposing to a normal line. Uh, this is very much like the deferred um, Steinitz, well, the deferred Steinitz was with a6, like the old Steinitz variation, where you would play d6 and bishop d7. And usually in those lines, the bishop would go to e7 and the knight would go to f6. It's a big improvement if you can get the bishop on this long diagonal effectively. Now you might say, well, where, where's the knight going? Why isn't the knight on e7? Well, it'll be there in a second. Okay, now the knight goes to e7. So you can imagine that this position could have come up from the other, from a move order with the knight e7 on the third move, right? So in other words, you play this against the Roy Lopez, white castles, let's say, and black plays either d6 or g6, and something like this, and this, and this, and this, and maybe he could play here. He could play here, he could just castle. But you can see how that could happen. Okay, so this game was a little different order, but the same principle. Bishop d7 is maybe the extra move you wouldn't necessarily make as black if you played the Cozio move order, but I thought it'd be interesting to look at. Okay, now one reason I wanted to show this is because this is a fun thematic line for white against all of these 
lines. It's the sort of thing I actually used to play when I was white. You go ahead and you play this, and the idea is you, you get rid of your good bishop, and you release pressure on the center, so it doesn't look that great. But I'm sorry, but this has now become your bad bishop because you're going to play the move c4 probably immediately. Uh, no, actually plays bishop e3 in this case, but you could play. You could also play c4. Uh, in fact, I think that's a more popular move and probably a little bit better because why commit the bishop yet? Um, so, for example, just to show you here, you've got a kind of king's Indian, and this bishop's kind of a bad piece now, and this bishop's a very good piece. So White's managed to exchange his bad bishop for black's fairly good bishop. Now, on the other hand, black stands very solidly, and he's ready to play f5. Um, but you have to be careful, because f5 could be answered by knight g5. So black might play h6, for example, to prepare f5. And white can just ignore f5. And let me, here, here I think this is really instructive. This kind of position you might you should kind of know about. If, if white played, OK, white in this game played, um, let me let me show you this one actually. White black played a5 in one of these games. Let me do that one. Black played a5 to stop b4. Otherwise b4 and, and c5 is an awfully good plan. Um, bishop e3 h6 so that after f5 white can't play knight g5, and then white plays knight d2 f5 f3. Well here we are in a normal sort of king's Indian right. Black could play here for example. And then black could start going like this and trying to attack on the king side. And here's the point I wanted to make. What's kind of fun about these lines where you get rid of this light squared bishop is that black misses his light squared bishop. And that light squared bishop is absolutely critical to make this attack work. Most king's Indians variations where you don't have that light squared bishop, this attack with g5, g4 won't work. Not all of them. Sometimes you can, you can still play it. You can still give it a try. But that bishop is really, really important in most attacks. And so white's probably going to claim that he's better here, and he probably is. I think that's a fair thing to say, that white, white stands better here. Okay, so I just want to show you that one. Um, in the game, white played this instead, which is a little bit funny. And here we go. There's, you can still just play here, for example and get the same kind of position we just talked about with f5 coming. Um, let me just show you this here. Comes here first for some reason. Uh, c4, a5, very similar to what we just looked at actually. And this is a game some people played. Uh, f5, a3, and sure enough, f4, trying to attack. So we'll have an example of this real quickly. And I'll try to make this uh, fast. Um, g5, b4. So both sides, you may recognize this from the King's Indian. White's attacking this pawn chain towards its base, and black's attacking this pawn chain towards its base, somewhere over here, and trying to open lines on the king's side. Well, white's trying to open lines on the queen's side. Uh, let me show you a few more moves. Uh, b4, b6, knight b3, still thinking about um, playing uh, c5. Notice that if a4, the knight retreats and this pawn can't be protected. Uh, so white plays probably knight g6, yeah. White plays knight g6, black plays knight g6. Takes, takes, probably c5. No, a4 first. Um, h5, trying to attack this way. These are all sort of standard King's Indian moves. But the point is, of showing you this, is you'll see that what I just said before is sort of true. This move isn't doing enough. It's not really achieving enough here. That's the idea. First of all, he can't even play it yet. He's got to kind of get it organized. And white's coming in really quickly. What black tried here was a little odd. He played um, this, this move here. I think it was Black's move, yeah. And, and what, that gave White the chance to actually take that and then block the king side. And now there's no king side attack we're speaking of because there's no light squared bishop to sacrifice on that square. And otherwise, how is Black ever going to break through this pawn structure? So White was much better and went on to win the game. Okay, so I, I think this 92 thing's very Interesting for black. Interesting for black, but this at least shows you one way of playing for white. Now, one thing to remember is black didn't have to play the line with bishop d7 if he played knight e7 first. So black doesn't have to accept this position. I just wanted to show you. I think it's an instructive position to look at. Um, yeah, I don't think bishop c5 is that impressive. A move, but should we see more of this game? Is this worth it? Let me see. Yeah, maybe this game isn't even that interesting. We don't want to take too much time on this. Um, a few more moves, maybe. So white starts trying to break through on the queen side. And black tries to challenge him there, but that's a center pawn, so I suspect white's better here. 
Maybe not. There's some counter pressure here. I don't think I want to show you this whole game. I think it's like a 60 move game. So maybe I'll stop there. So that gives you an idea of the sort of play that can happen. And then I'll, I was going to show one more game. Um, I don't know. It's funny that these little irregular openings, there's still some hope for. I mean, I was surprised how many good players play this. 2500s, 2600s against good opposition. So here we go again with the um, the G6 order. But this time he's not going to play uh, bishop d7, so it will be a, an original order. Now this this position's come up quite a lot, actually. And black almost always plays this freeing maneuver, takes and d5, sort of like a Joko piano or something like that, to get his share of the center there. And this is considered roughly equal. In this game, white, I think, got a slight advantage. He played this nice move, bishop g5, which has been played a lot, and then checked. Um, so now the nice thing about black, okay, it's an isolated pawn position, but white's very active, has nice open lines, the c-file, the e-file, um, all its pieces are active. On the other hand, black has one advantage that he often doesn't have against that isolated pawn, which is that that bishop is aiming right at it. So that's very nice. So this position's probably roughly equal. White plays here wanting to come into this square or this square and attack. And strange to say, this exact position here has happened repeatedly. This has actually been a very common position. It's arisen quite a lot. And uh, White scored slight plus here, but not much. So anyway, in this game, he takes. He attacks that. And then I think Black makes a mistake here. Yeah, Black plays this move. And now this is this game's been played in correspondence chess, played in a lot of different games. It turns out it's better to play here because this rook is handy for kind of protecting these, these squares on the king's side. And that would be a strong move. Um, because, for example, if you play... Okay, so now bishop g4 is a really good idea for Black or bishop f5. So White can try and stop that. But then we have... Um, this move, and if captures to go here, that's that's just a losing move. It looks like it, maybe you could play it to protect that, but um, oh, I'm sorry, that doesn't work at all because the bishop here. Sorry, but in any case, this is uh, considered perfectly good for black. This position, plenty of activity. There's a lot of lot of activity to make up for this these, this pawn structure, and there's also a, well, a very weak pawn there. So um, that's a little theory for you, but it shows that this whole kind of idea is playable. In this game, he played rook f8, and he really paid for it. This, by the way, is the game Tivyakov uh, Sokolov. Ivan Sokolov has played this repeatedly, by the way. He's a 2650 type player who's been around for many years, Dutch championship winner many times. Really, really strong player and a great, great author. Um, okay, the queen came back, but this game he lost. He should have played, um, I think he lost. Yeah, he did lose this game. White should actually put a knight on c5, very natural move. I don't know why he didn't play it. That would be, it would have been better because black actually does equalize now. Um, but eventually white wins this game. Uh, so I don't know what the lesson of this, the, this part of the game is. Maybe that these pawns really are weak and so black has to play very accurately to, to uh, come back in this game. All these moves, oddly enough, had been played before, <laughs> amazingly enough. And Black had drawn a game before from this position. That was actually a new move, believe it or not. It shows about, th you get theory even in these weird weird kind of openings. So, um, uh, oh, Alan, you went to the Isle of Man. I didn't realize that. Yeah, we could talk about that. And I, I think I learned some things about, you know, people ask me, we have a lot of older um, players and I think I learned some things about if you were going to try and be a better player as an older player, like what you might do. You know, Jim Tarjan, I, you guys probably heard about. He's been on this show. He came on the show a couple of times, a good friend of mine. He he uh, did very well. He beat, he not only beat Kramnik in a game, not maybe the greatest game of all time. I don't think he'd brag about it that much, but still beating Kramnik is incredible. And he also beat a couple other grandmasters and finished just incredibly strongly. I don't know what his performance rating was, but I think 2,700 or something like that. And Jim's 65, which is what I am, actually. So he shows that you don't, they don't, you don't have to collapse as badly as I, as I do as, at an older age. But he also uh, does some very professional things. He plays more often. He really, he plays very often, much more often than I do. And he also, um, you know, he goes to the tournaments early and gets plenty of rest and uh, uh, just plays. He has much better habits. And that would be my, the lesson that I got out of the last 
maybe year or two of playing is that you, I can't, if I was going to get a little better, I would have to be much more systematic and uh, better prepared and um, also get, don't just pop over to this second time I've popped over to one of these things and not, and been sort of jet lagged. Um, okay. So we're getting some questions here. This is good. I'll go back to the questions. Let's finish this game. Um, Let me show you one other thing. Yeah, okay, well, let's let's go ahead, and then we'll go back to the opening. I'll show you some one last thing about the Cozio that I think is interesting. Okay, so both sides are just maneuvering here. And eventually, White's, White's won a lot of squares here. Black's trying to attack. And I think White just won that pawn. Black just doesn't have enough attack here. It's close. I mean, Sokolov's such a good player. It's not like he's going to go down easy. And then... Um, White gives up the exchange, but look at all the pawns he's getting for it and all the squares he's got, plus this beautiful pass pawn. And then things really fall apart. That turns out to be a very bad move. Uh, maybe he was in trouble anyway, but that, that turned out to just lose there because now the king has no good square. The queen's probably going to be lost, actually. And all, well, also, you can just take that next in many variations after the knight moves. It just depends where he goes, but there's either mate or something horrible happens. Okay, so interesting game. Let me just show you one quick thing there I wanted to show you, which was, um, oh yeah, if you don't take on d4, it's very interesting. If you just castle, very natural move, right? Um, let me see what I have here. I have d5, a6, bishop e2. Um, knight a7, oh, I see, d6. And that explains why he took. And that positionally is just fantastic. Look at that queen on that square. This this guy's stuck. Um, it's just, you'll never get your deep on out uh, because there's no way to attack this queen. There's no way to get to the queen quickly to get rid of it. So white's got a huge advantage here. I mean, already he's sort of threatened to just bring a bishop in there or maybe bring a knight into one of these squares, either d6 or b6. So um, that's why you play the e takes d4 line here, just to explain, because it looks awfully odd giving up the center like that. But it, but it ends up working out pretty well because of this move d5. This move d5 comes out quite well. Um, but just to explain why he doesn't just castle, and he can't really play here probably for roughly the same reason, right? Let's just see. Well, there's no d6, so it's not the same reason. This might be interesting. Let me see. How would this go? I'm not absolutely sure why white's better here if he is better. Maybe here? And then what would happen if black just got out of the pin? Oh, I see. Queen a7 might happen. Oh, I don't know. Maybe can can uh, can black play this way? It's risky. It's obviously very, very risky. I mean, the bishop can just move back, for one thing. And the knight doesn't have many good squares once once b5 is played. I, I don't like it. I, li I mean, I don't know if you guys see, but the, the knights aren't coordinating well. This knight's going to have to go here, for example, after a move like that. And then... Black can play, maybe he, white can play here. Black, blacks, the, these pieces are not well placed, so I guess that's what's going on. Okay, enough of the Cozio, but I think, yeah, take a look at it. Take a look at this, um, take a look at this move, knight ge7. I, I, if I'm playing e4, e5 for black, I think I might consider playing that. Okay, so let's go back and get to some questions. Sorry about this. I've got a lot of other prepared stuff, too, because we've been two weeks, and I got a bunch of questions by mail. Um... Okay, we've got the Smith-Mora thing. Is e6 followed by bishop b4 playable? Um, we've talked a fair amount about the Smith-Mora. Um, this is the Smith-Mora book. Oh, i got to show you something. This is really funny. Mark Esserman, who wrote the Smith-Mora book, was at the Isle of Man. And um, I'm going to have to see if I get this right. He played... <laughs> Let's just go. He played here. Oh, man. Am I going to get this right? How did this go? Oh, no, I, I don't know. I, I want to be careful here. It turned into a, a slob somehow. Oh, shoot. Sorry, I'll try and do this for next week. It was a really funny thing where he tried to transpose into the Smith Mora from a queen pawn opening. <laughs> it was really great. He won the game, too. It was kind of cool. But, um, okay, so Smith Mora. Sorry, back to the question. The question is um, here, here, this is the Smith Moore, and then here. And uh, it's amazing how many people decline it. Mark Esmer was telling me about that, just how many people decline it. 
And somebody else who played the Smith Moore for years was at the tournament. And he was talking about the same thing. So it's almost like you don't have to worry about whether it's sound because so many people decline it. And of course, Anand declined it against Mark Esserman, and they drew the game, and Esserman was winning. So, you know, that's Anand, one of the great players of our time or even of history. Um, people decline it a lot because they're scared to go into the theory. Um, so the question is, can you play bishop b4 after an e6? Now, I guess it depends on the order. Maybe this, this, I, I'm not sure what you exactly want to play, but maybe something like bishop b4 now. I don't really like it because all your threat is is to maybe give up the bishop, and then, of course, these squares become really weak. So I'm not thrilled with this idea at all because it, it's going to weaken your dark squares a lot. Um, yeah, my first instinct is no. This is not something I'd want to play. I guess it's possible. Uh, you might want to say some more about it, a chess philosopher, uh, talking about what what else, what, how black might kind of get organized, because this could get very difficult very quickly. Um, because if you if you aren't going to take here, what are you going to do with this? You know, you're not. It's not a very active piece. And um, white's got. You got to watch out for e5 followed by knight e4 too. Um, and then you might have to take it. And the minute you take it, there's this problem with bishop a3 coming down on those dark squares. It, you know, it's probably playable. Most things are against the Smith Moore. Most things you can you can get away with. But um, I, 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 I'm not my my first instinct is not good. That's all I'll say about it. You could be right. It could be a good decent move, but I don't like that so much. I'm thinking of going with the Barman against the Smith Moore. D5 and Queen D5, maybe E6. Okay, so that's not really. That's just the yeah part of the Alpin variation. That's transposing to um, a C3 line by playing like this and takes and this, right? That's what you're saying? Um, and maybe E6, yeah, French Tarot structure, yeah. And this is a standard way. This comes from the, also from the Alapin opening. This comes from this. Very popular answer is this move. And then after that, uh, uh, here. Although it is true that after D4, you don't usually take. You usually play here first, keep things flexible for a little while so the knight can't come to C3. So I would say that You'd have to look at this if you're going to play it against the Smith Mora because you, you're committing to the C takes D4 move. May, you may not want to do that. Let's see. Okay, so the problem is he's already threatening this. So what you could do, there's an old line that people used to play that goes like this, and I don't know what the theory is right now about that. It's a very messy, long, long, long line. And uh, it used to be thought white was slightly better in these positions, but uh, who knows anymore? This the, the it was still being fought about quite some time ago, so you could do that. The problem is if you just play straightforwardly now with e6, you've got knight c3, and I don't know if you want to bring your bishop out that early. This is this is pretty nice. I kind of like I kind of like white here. This is a pretty good version for white. White's going to castle and try and force black to take that and strengthen his center. And if black doesn't take that, white, black's going to have to retreat, and then this bishop is going to be very well placed to defend black's king side. So it's going to be a standard isolated pawn position. Maybe not the best one. Uh, an occasional one, very good. So Sokolov uh, does talk about it. This is great. Okay, um, did I skip another question while I was in the middle of that? I don't think so. Okay, so keep asking questions, guys. Um, 2800, I played in a tournament, uh, and in the tournament I had two guys yelling when they blundered. No, people shouldn't uh, shouldn't be loud. Or no, I one thing about Isle of Man that was great, besides the conditions and the lighting and plenty of room to play in. I mean, European tournaments are so wonderful, but um, nobody was rude or odd. Nobody misbehaves. Nobody's like eating at the board and jumping up and down and or yelling at each other. None of that going on. Okay, John, I have trouble with this black queen gambit line with double fianchetto and queen c2. Doesn't sound like a queen gambit. I mostly play the semi-slav against it, but get no play at all. I feel extremely boxed, and I can't want to make a plan. That sounds kind of like a catalan, maybe. That could be a catalan, which of course you don't have to accept. But um, for example, if you play the queen's gambit declined, and they play like this, a lot of times later on you'll see a, a b3 and a bishop b2, a double fiend shadow. Or if black plays here, you might see a bishop c3 later with a b3, a b3 and a bishop c3. And bishop b2. Top players play this for black, uh, especially recently. Um, they, they're willing to play passively with b6 and bishop b7. I've never liked playing this way for black, but now I can see why, why players do this. You do want to drag the bishop here first. You want to lure the bishop there first. 
and then play, um, because then 94 has more effect. And that's, in fact, the only version of the system that's working for black. Um, white tends to play this move, and then black goes like this. And you would think a position like this would just favor white, because he has more space, and he's about to play e4. But black's been playing this line and not doing that badly. And the other thing he's been doing in these positions is playing an early knight e4, and then, e, and then f5. And Nakamura has played this, for example. For example, like right here, might play that. And if the bishop saves itself, so what? You, you still play, when you play for this move, I don't know how quickly you play that move. You might play knight d7 first or something. And this has been working okay for black. Um, so the idea is get, play a stone wall. Just get a lot of space and uh, play a stonewall pawn structure. So I guess that's what I'd recommend. Get an early 94 in. Now, I don't know if you're talking about the exact Catalan move order, but there's very little other way for white to get both b3 and g3 in. So because if white plays something like b3 really early, that's pretty bad usually because of bishop b4 check ideas. And also c5 has more effect because the dark squares are weaker now. You see these dark squares are kind of weak. You don't want to play b3 too early. So I suspect what you're talking about is a G3 system. Okay, so what I would, I, I'd recommend doing that, that check because it drags the bishop away from being fan shadowed. And if the knight goes there, it doesn't really want to go there because it wants to end up on C3. But if you play knight C3 immediately, of course, it's pinned and you'll have knight E4 ideas and C5 ideas and Nims or Indian kind of ideas, and that's always nice. And even, even D takes C4, it's actually a little hard to get the pawn back sometimes. So um, so bishop d2 is played by everybody, but then you just go back again. And as I say, later on, maybe you can play for this idea of knight e4 and f5. That's my only recommendation right now. And the reason I recommend that is because the professionals are all doing that. Um, why is NIGE saying that? I don't know. When he went in and saw the result, he realized it was Tarsh, and he said, I don't know what you're talking about with knight. Oh, here we go. Whoa, excuse me. There's a funny story by Simon Williams. Oh, 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 I missed a whole bunch of uh, Tarsian rocks. He certainly does. If John thinks I did badly, yeah, okay, one more try. Uh, tournament rating Tarsian 2671. Yeah, not bad for a 65 year old. Sokolov was a heavyweight for a while. Absolutely. Still a pretty strong player. Tarsian was on fire. Senior player poster child loved it. A funny story about Simon Williams, who was ace on the commentary with the incredibly attractive sidekick, yeah, Fiona is getting world famous. He said he was walking down the main road on IOM and Nigel Short came up to him and said, yay, Tarzan. Uh, he thought he meant Tarzan and Jane. <laughs> that's pretty silly. When he went in and he saw the result, he realized it was Tarzan. Okay, that's a cute story. Yeah. Jim's, Jim has been playing very well. Actually, it's funny. In this tournament, he actually had a little bit of luck, but but um, the two tournaments before that, he really showed how strong he's be becoming. I mean, he's played much better in the last six months than in the earlier part of his return, which, and he didn't play badly then either, but now he's playing really well. So it's very inspiring for us old guys. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's maybe the answer to this double fianchetto question. Let me see if I can show you some other stuff that people asked over the last couple of weeks, although I didn't get that many questions since I left. Um, anyway, where is this? Mm. Did I finish that game that I was showing? Wait a minute. Sorry about this. What do we have here? The Tibia game I finished. Oh, I see what's going on. I'm just disorganized. All my sheets are in the wrong order. So I might have to just bring up the games and show them to you. I got a question about... Um, well, I got a bunch of questions. One we might I might address was from the week before about um, the King's Indian attacking with white in the King's Indian Samish. And I thought I'd show a few, few sample games. Now I promised to answer that. And it's, an, it's too broad a question in many ways, but I thought, well, it's kind of interesting just talking about the ways that white attacks. It depends on blacks. Uh, let me just do this in sort of order. It depends on blacks choice of defenses, of course, because black can play all kinds of things. Remember I said about the King's Indian that one interesting thing about it is both white and black can play on the king side, both white, black and white can play in the center, and both white, black and white can play on the queen side, so that's what makes it so much fun. But it also makes it hard to talk about strategies, because they vary so much depending on what your opponent does. Okay, so here's the first game. 
In fact, this Alan Hamilton is a, a, a person who beat me in the Isle of Man, and it was a real interesting London system. So maybe I'll show you that game next week. Or I could even show you this week, but I think we're going to run out of time. Okay, so let, this is an answer to that King's Indian uh, Samish, which I thought was a, a really interesting question. I was trying to think, how can I shorten the answer? Because there's so many things going on. Okay, so this is the King's Indian Samish. Fun system for white. I've been thinking about taking this up. I played it just a little bit. Um, as an alternative to my favorite lines, which are all with h3, either immediately or, or later, usually immediately. I've been playing it a couple of nice games. Actually, I won one game and drew one game in the Isle of Man with h3. Um, anyway, so after f3, uh, that's the same as defense, I mean, attack. Um, notice that there's no knight g4 now. And what I just thought I'd show first is just e5, the basic thing that most people do in the King's Indian. So if you want to know about how to attack as white in the, um, what to do as white in the same issue, you first have to know what to do against various e5 systems. And that would include playing knight c6 in e5, playing knight d7 in e5, but all these e5 ideas. So now you can push. That's a standard idea. One thing about pushing is it, run, it sometimes runs into that move, and that can be a little bit awkward. There's this famous... Um, queen sacrifice that Bronstein invented in this line. One thing black wants to do is just here, but there's other tricky ideas uh, that black has. For example, um, playing uh, after this move, there's this move queen check. And if here, you can go here. If here, you're sort of offering a draw. And if white plays here, you can take this, <clears throat> which seems terrible because black can, um, uh, wait, I'm sorry. What's going on here? I'm sorry, black can play this move, and then it looks like white's winning a piece because you can't play knight f5 because they're just taking, and otherwise the knight's pinned. But there's this famous um, queen sacrifice for two pieces. There's the two pieces, and you usually get that pawn too because you're threatening knight here, check, winning the queen. And amazingly enough, this is still considered sound. It's still played uh, regularly. On the This is still considered fine, even in correspondence chess. So... So that's why white very, very often will not play uh, d5 this early. He'll just play a very simple defensive move instead. And now d5 becomes more of an idea. But, but first of all, just playing very flexibly. So without going through a lot. Of, now, that's very natural if you're a King's Indian player, because in the main lines of the King's Indian, you play there. And if he plays e5, you play there. Now, this has a bad reputation, but it may not be that terrible. Most people think white's just better here, and it's because of the following move. Well, maybe not even this move. The idea of g4. Uh, I think Shandorf and other people recommend playing it right away. I think maybe even Karpov played it right away. It's kind of a technical point. So let's just look at the game, and you'll see the point of the move. Okay, now f5 is about to come. So what white does is he meets that with... Um, okay, normally we'll meet that with g4 is a standard sort of idea. But I wanted to show you this game because it shows you one of white's main themes is that even if black gets a lot of space on the king side, gets sort of a standard looking position on the king side, white can win on the queen side in the same ish. Unlike, there's so many openings where white can't castle queen side because it's too risky because he gets attacked too quickly. But the same ish is a big exception. Very, very often you'll see white, um, uh, once again, white was thinking about playing g4. Very, very often you'll see white winning on the queen side. So that's one way you can attack in the Samish, is to play for c5. b4 and c5, knight b3, rook c1. Turns out that black doesn't have enough space to attack you on that side of the board. So I just thought I'd show this game as a typical sort of, uh, typical way a, a good, a strong player beats a somewhat weaker player in the Samish. Okay, now you've got some squares over there to work with and weaknesses. White has more space because of this structure here, and that means he's going to win on the queen side. When you have more space, you're able to um, dominate eventually. Now he's got pieces coming to b5. He's got rook c1. That's coming very soon, I'm sure. Actually, I don't remember this game, but I'm sure there it is. So now the rook was about to come to c7, so he had to stop that. Now these are weak, and in particular b6 is almost falling. Okay, now b6 is attacked again. d6 is attacked. Looks like, um, I think white's winning material here. Oh my goodness, that's the end of the game. I guess black actually resigned already. And maybe that's understandable, because once knight takes d6 happens, then you lose the b6 pawn too. So, seems a little early, but 
definitely, definitely a winning position. Okay, so I just want to show you that idea of, of uh, that's one, one way to attack in the same as on the queen side, and you'll see that happening very, very often. And another way to attack on the queen side is, is let me show you this one. These are just simple games. I didn't want to make anything too complicated. Oops, wrong game, it looks like. Uh, let me try percentage 314. This is a Dreyev game. Dreyev's played the same-ish pretty much his whole life, I think, and won all kinds of wonderful games. Okay, so here's the same-ish. Oh, maybe I should show you how the opening sort of breaks down normally. For example, in this position, Black plays... Black, one of Black's main professional moves is the move C5. We actually talked about that briefly in some other, some one of these other shows. Uh, Knight C6, which I've played a lot and written about, um, and um, and of course E5, which we just talked about. Sometimes Black plays these kinds of things. It's actually been fairly popular over the years, but it seems to have a terrible, terrible record. And I think that's just because it's too slow. It just doesn't do enough. But that's just, and I've also had good luck against it as white in, in similar systems. H3 systems, you get the same thing. Um, what else? Well, this is usually going to be an E5 system, sometimes a C5 system. That's a good flexible move, actually, because sometimes white, white uh, black does play C5, and sometimes he plays E5. Um, am I missing something? I think those are the main, the main lines. Uh, but right now we're kind of concentrating more on real basic things. Okay, so instead of knight e3 played, instead of bishop e3 played knight e2 first, black played a6. That's a good flexible move. Often it goes with knight c6, so that's called the Pano defense. The line I played for a long time actually beat Gowan Jones in this, uh, in this thing. So I can beat Grandmasters, I just couldn't do it in this tournament. Uh, don't do it very often anymore. Um, okay, so that's a standard line for white. Is This is a standard sort of setup. Knight here, queen here, bishop here. Given the chance, white might just try to checkmate. So black's counterattacking on the queen side. He's thinking about playing b5. And white plays this move, rook b1. And I wanted to show you that because it's, again, a queen side plan, as opposed to a lot of the moves that uh, are played instead of this are either this or maybe even knight back and knight up, a sort of central plan, like knight back and... Um, if there, maybe just knight up, for example, or even here, and then the knight comes back to, to challenge this. And then white tries to win in the center, for example. He'll actually castle queen side, a king side, and then maybe start attacking. That's one way to play. Okay, so, but in this game, white plays this interesting move, rook b1, and it's another queen side plan. Black follows through with his queen side attack, but now white decides, okay, I've got as much or more on the queen side as you do. Because I've got this bishop aiming that way, and this bishop aiming that way, and I'm able to play d5 with a space advantage, and then put my knight on d4. So that's a big threat. So black has to respond to that quickly, and and then white has to get out of the way so he can get castled. So that means black gets a chance to recover a little bit and get some pieces out. So black counterattacks in the center. The, the other thing you could do is try to attack with f5. But I think in the same as very often, f5 isn't, isn't really, it takes too long to get organized because white wins on the queen side before, before black can uh, break through or do anything on the king side. So he tries to break in the center instead, which makes a lot of sense. In fact, that's what I did against Gowan Jones. And now black's hoping to get d5 in. The only problem with d5 is there's this bishop c5 move. And in fact, what happens, he plays bishop c5 now, and that pins this and puts a little more pressure on that square. It's a nice outpost. So here I kind of like white, although black's in the game. Black's got space. Um, now he attacks that bishop, but the bishop manages to survive. And then white gets the move f4 in, which is highly desirable to activate the knight, the rook, uh, and also kind of support the bishop. But I think black was still okay. That, I believe, was a mistake. I think black was still okay in this in this game if he had played a little more accurately. Now white switches to this queenside advanced stuff again because if black plays there now, you've got this b5. Well, you also have uh, bishop c4 and queen a2 and moves like that. So um, I don't think he took. Let me see. Or did he take? No, he played there instead. There is this problem, though, now that the king's more exposed. And so what white does is plays here, and he's suddenly winning sort of tactically. Check on the king. And the point is, so it looks like he's giving up this piece, but he's hoping to get this one. Well, this loses, but the problem is this loses too. If you play there, you get, uh, I think, queen e6. Maybe takes first. 
Because if bishop takes, you have check, and the king is in big trouble, and you lost a pawn. But if queen takes, I think you might even lose a piece. How do you defend that without losing something else? Anyway, it looks awful. I'm not sure you know, if, if it's over completely, but if, if the natural move is this, and then you have this problem, and if rook here, you just take that and you take this one next. So I think that's just winning. So already this game is over. Black plays here, hoping that after taking, uh, he can get that move in and just stay even in material, but after that move he can resign, and he does resign. Because if the queen takes, you have knight here check, winning the queen, nice little fork. And if the queen moves back, you have d6 check, winning at least a piece, because this is check. And then you take here. So Dreyev really knows how to ha kind of handle these positions, and it kind of shows you what fun you can have in the Samish, because you have more space, and you have and you have a natural queenside attack. And in this case, he had a natural sort of central and kingside attack, too. So it just shows you it's a very flexible opening. And maybe I'll try one more. Does h3 in the king's inning work well with bishop d3, knight e2, kind of like a Samish? Um, depends what black plays. Uh, I would say not usually, but there are some lines where you can play that way. I tend to play h3 with um, with bishop g5 and bishop e3 and knight f3 usually. Eventually, I usually play knight f3, and I can show you why that is. Someone asked about h3. Maybe it was you, chess philosopher, so maybe we'll go over that next week. I wanted to, to address that anyway. Um, let, let me just let me just say what that question was. That question was essentially something like. Um, if you play h3 instead, does that go very well with bishop d3 and knight e2? I would say there's one line where it does go pretty well. Uh, Yermolinsky plays this way sometimes with this bishop d3 move. But um, he also plays it with bishop g5, too. Um, what I was going to say is, yeah, for just for example, uh, uh, the kind of line he sometimes plays is something like bishop d3 here now, and then often you might play knight e2 later. I play this line too, but I play it with knight f3 usually. Anyway, yeah, so you can play it probably only against c5. I don't think against e5 it works very well. Let me think about that. Um, it would be white's move here. Of course, you have to worry about this now, followed by just e5, or maybe knight d7. Um, but if e5, d5, let me think about this for a second. Do you ever play knight e2 here? Yeah, I suppose you could play there. It's not my favorite setup. My favorite setup in these positions is to play knight f3. And if you're worried about f5, you play g4. So in other words, um, well, even if you did this right away, if you played here, you might just play g4. You might. I'm not sure, but you might play g4 right away. That really discourages f5 badly because white gets that file. and um, So so maybe that's not a total question. I'll look at it. I'll copy the uh, chat and maybe look at it for next week. Well, I, I think looking at h3 kings in would be really interesting. Yeah, I don't play often enough, John. I've got all kinds of excuses. I'm also just a weaker player now, but I did notice that I was fine conceptually analyzing with all the GMs, even the top guys, uh, doing just fine. I understood everything and didn't feel like I was strategically you know, missing anything. But um, there were a couple guys, especially these guys from India, where I realized my calculating will never be as good as these guys. I mean, I'm definitely too old to calculate that quickly. Amazing tactical eyes, just in fun analysis, just throwing out all these beautiful tactical ideas. It was, it was very impressive and a lot of fun. And I'm, I can tell as an older player that I'm never going to be able to even think about matching that kind of thing. So I'm going to have to play more practical lines. I, I play too much main theory like I used to, old lines that I used to play, but I haven't kept up with them. They're too sharp. I think when you're older, you probably have to play a little more calmly. Okay, what's the best way to play against the Yugoslav attack? Is it better to play the Nidorf Dragon or Dragdorf? <laughs> well, that's a pretty general question. Uh, the best way to play against the Yugoslav attack, um, for Black to play against the Yugoslav attack. Last time I looked, Black was having pretty good luck with, um, you know, Chris Ward has written about this for over 10 years in monthly dragons in his, his uh, dragon column in, for chess publishing. And I'm sure he can tell you exactly what's working and what isn't. Um, I asked Keaton Kira, a friend of mine, about the dragon, and he, he says there are some lines that are a little difficult. He had, um, it's, it's not being played as much. One thing I was going to say for black against the Yugoslav, this is the Yugoslav attack here, playing like this. Um, 
one line I think is kind of interesting. Now, if castles, well, first of all, there, there's this move, and you can play underwrite main lines here uh, if you want to. You can just play normal main line stuff. Like, for example, um, if white plays h4, you play h5 ideas, you know, this kind of thing. Here and here and knight here, and then if h4, you just play h5. The old Soltis variations, they're still doing just fine for black. So that's one way to play, but white has options too. I was going to say, a line that's working pretty well, as far as I remember, is some of this b5 stuff. Now, how does that go exactly? Um, is it this position? Hmm. Sorry. I mean, I saw one of these, by the way, at Isle of Man, one of these g4 moves um, by a really strong player. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Oh, what's what's working? There's, there's one line that was pretty impressive, but I don't see how you can play. Maybe maybe it sacrifices a pawn. It's that thing that Topalov played with knight takes d4 and bd7 and bishop d and and b5. So maybe it goes something like. Um, I don't think you can do it here. Yeah. Oh well. Anyway, I think so. You you just have to look it up. I don't really remember what the best lines are against against the Yugoslav, and and you have to have a different line against here and against Castle and Queenside. So um, just have to study a lot of theory. Uh, is it better to play the Nidorf Dragon or Dragdorf? The Dragdorf I think is a little risky. Um, it was fun when people had never seen it before. The Dragdorf is playing this, so you're playing like a Nidorf but with the Dragon, Fianchetto. Carlson played it briefly. Um, you know, I think it's lost some popularity. What it is, it's an English opening reversed. This is the, this is the English, there's a line in the English opening that's exactly like this, where black plays these moves, these f3, e4 moves, uh, and it plays knight, knight takes d5, and, and um, it's a whole tempo up for white, and I get this feeling that's very easy and comfortable for white to play, if he, if he knows what he's doing, if he's prepared. So I don't think I'd, I probably wouldn't recommend the drag door, the, the um, drag dwarf. Um, the Nidorf is certainly something that will serve you your whole life, and you'll learn a ton about chess, but you have to know a lot of theory. The main thing you have to know is this, because it's the most critical line. You can get mated if someone plays that. Most of the other lines you can play positionally. You can, you can play, you know, against this kind of move, you can play E5 lines or E6 lines, but you, you can actually play E5 or E6 lines against almost all the major Nidorf lines. Um, this has become thought of as really, really harmless, maybe even better for black in a lot of lines, so you don't have to worry about that so much. You have to study it, but, um, and of course, people are playing things like this, but those are all heavily positional and strategic. I think it'd be fun to take up the night or if you, um, if you don't have an opening at all. In other words, if you've got some time to really specialize in one opening, and you're just starting out, and you want to just pick one, I, I think I would pick the night or because it's the best objectively, too. Um, yeah, actually, I think I gave a giving a really bad answer, Thylo Fold, <laughs> Thylo Twenty Eight Fold. So it's very nice of you to thank me. But uh, but yeah, of the three, I would take I would take the uh, the 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 thing about the Dragdorf. It's a little slow, so it's a little risky. Um, okay, so let me see. Where are we? Did I miss some other questions? Because I have other games to show. It is already past time a little bit. Um, yeah, it's funny because I've been getting emails about Jim Tarjan. Uh, uh, you know, people are very excited. Us old fogies. It's good to see somebody do really well. Um, okay, let me see. What do we have here? Oh, yeah, the double fianchetto. I hope I helped with that answer. I'd have to, you know, one thing you, all you guys can do, send send me a game or just a line or more specific lines when you have these questions to, um, to my email, to the... Um, Ask I am Watson at chessclub.com, A S K I M W A T S O N at C H E S S C L U B dot C O M. And then you can ask a question like, I have trouble with this black uh, queen gambit line with the double Fianchetto and queen C2. I think, um, I think, um, uh, specific positions and specific move orders, I could really, uh, really get into depth and show you some good plans to play as black. I think it's the Catalan line you're talking about. And as I say, maybe that 94 ID is a good answer. Uh, maybe one more game. As long as, as, long as we're doing the same-ish thing, I thought I'd show you one more where, where white attacks on the king side, just so you can see a king side game. And then we'll wrap it up with that. Hopefully you can enjoy this a little bit because it's always fun to see king side attacks.
Remember, the question was what white should do. I could also show you what black should do, but that wasn't really the, the question of the week. These are sort of ideal things for white, and black's allowing them to happen. So it's not as though this is forced. Or remember, I talked about this move, very flexible, usually related with that move, sometimes related with this move. I think in this game he played c5. No, he didn't. He played e5. Okay, so he's playing another e5 system. And you could play d5 here, but you can also play queen d2 and keep it flexible. So now the c6. Now usually white plays d5 here. He does, which, by the way, threatens to take and play here. So black kind of has to commit to either taking or advancing. So he advances. And the only problem with positions like this is black has no outpost for his knight here, so he has no real space on the queen side to do anything. And he can't play a6 and b5 because you can just stop that anytime you want to with a4. So that means he has to play on the king side. Well, the problem is white also has more, because of d5 versus d6, white's doing fine on the king side. And you'll see how that works. There it is. Already white's staking out space on the king side. So black has no counterplay here. That's the problem. So this whole line, I think is, I think it's fair to say, just isn't very good for black. White would like to go h4, h5 if he can. That would be really nice. Um, black plays a6. A handy move to make sometimes in these positions is here to try and make white commit. That's probably the move I would make there. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll look at that later. So knight there. Okay, trying to trying to hold down on h5 for one thing. And also, sometimes there's knight sacrifices on f5. That's that's how good white's kingside attack can be. Okay, so black tries desperately to get counterplay with b5. White could have stopped that, but he wasn't too worried about it. He simply just keeps attacking on the king side. So that's a, this is a fun game because of that. Let me see if I have notes about this. Oh, I was supposed to show a game this week. Sorry, I'll get to that next week. The Tom Leah game. Yeah, okay, I'll get that next week. Um, okay, so black's, black's counterattacking on the queen side, but that takes another defender away from the king side. So white just keeps pounding away. This is Svetushkin, by the way, who's a big Samish expert as white, and he plays a lot of nice games. Now that knight looks like it's been chased back, but look, it might head over to the king side too. Everything's kind of looking towards the king side here. Black's trying to attack with a4, but it's a little slow. Okay, get rid of that defender, just like the dragon. So this is very much like the Yugoslav attack of the dragon, where you're going to get rid of the defender and just break through on the h-file. Got to be a little careful about playing bishop h6, because sometimes black can take that, and that is white's good bishop, and then you're stuck with a bad bishop. So positionally, you don't really want to trade those bishops, but if you've got an attack that can't be stopped, well, then all the rules are off. This rook b2 is kind of clever, because it might mean rook h2 later to really increase the attack. I don't think white needed that in this game. Okay, black tries to just break through as fast as possible. And white comes up. Now it's getting very serious, because of this move, this move knight f5 is getting kind of serious. Um, Notice that he can't take that because of checkmate. And if he takes with the bishop, there's going to be other attacks. So black takes. And white uh, makes a kind of clever move. trying to black, black does, trying to break through as fast as possible. And white plays rook g2, which is interesting, because you'd think he might play rook h2 to really pile up on the file. But his idea is to play um, knight f5. And then the rook will be right coming down on that file. And um, so black plays the knight back, and I think that's just a blunder. Probably it's probably better to just try to fend off the attack, just make a neutral move, something like this, for example, and just see what you can do with the attack. I think white's close to winning, but not exactly. After this, that's, that's too important a defender. So after this nice move, really, it's all over. Knight takes queen is threatened, and he has to take it, really, and when he takes it, this rook just suddenly came into play. So now we have both rooks, and um, g6 can't be held. So this is almost resignable. I don't know what he plays. Uh, just makes a move. Oh, and then that, the one reason I want to show you this is because there's this cute finish. Rather than just smashing through, which I'm sure would just win immediately, you know, this is just a kill, but white decides to get incredibly fancy instead and plays check, little queen sacrifice, and then check, and how is black supposed to get out of this? He tries king g7. Uh, same thing, king g8 is no better. It's exactly the same position because double check on the king and then check. And if the king comes up, checkmate. It's very cute. And if the knight comes over, then at the very least you're winning massive, massive, massive material. All with check. 
So you're already at least a piece up and you're probably going to checkmate him pretty quickly. So um, very nice little sacrifice. He played king g7 and I think exactly the same combination happens. Um, is that right? Yeah, he just he resigned now because it doesn't help to play here. All that does is get you mated very similarly. If you play up here, well, for one thing, you could take that, which I didn't even notice, but you could also just play check and check and have the same position we just talked about. So, so a nice game to finish off with, and maybe they'll show you some of the themes. White can attack on the queen side or the king side in the same issue, sometimes in the center. Okay, what do we have here? Um, <laughs> always check, it might be check. <laughs> yeah, queen h7, really fun. Nice way to finish a game, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't you like to have that in a tournament game? Even if, it was, even if it wasn't necessary, it was a lot of fun. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Please send me your questions uh, to askiamwatson at chessclub.com. You can also, by the way, message me on ICC and ask me anything uh, or send any kind of message you want. But anyway, that's John L. Watson, L is in Lion. So it's J-O-H-N-L-W-A-T-S-O-N. For that, you have to be an ICC member. You just message John L. Watson and send me any kind of note you want to, and I'll try to respond as soon as possible. I can respond to these things all personally, by the way, but I can also, I really appreciate when there's something that's good for the show as well. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for coming on, because I know you missed, when I missed two weeks, I was afraid nobody would, <laughs> people would start giving up on us, but, I, but a lot of you came back, and that's a lot of fun. So thank you, everybody, and I'll see you next week.